wore black denim trousers and motorcycle boots and a black leather jacket with an eagle on the back. He had a hopped up sickle that took off like a gun. That fool was the terror of Highway 101. The California climate is perfect for bikes, as well as surfboards, convertibles, swimming pools, and a buoy. Most cyclists are harmless weekend types, no more dangerous than skiers or skin divers. But ever since the end of World War II, the West Coast has been plagued by gangs of young wild men on motorcycles, roaming the highways in groups of 10 or 30, and stopping whenever they get thirsty or road cramped to suck up some beer and make noise. The hell broth of publicity in 1965 made the phenomena seem brand new. But even in the ranks of the Hell's Angels, there are those who insist that the outlaw scene went over the hump in the mid-50s, when the original faces began drifting off to marriage and mortgages and time payments. The whole thing was born, they say, in the late 1940s, when most ex-GIs wanted to get back to an orderly pattern. College, marriage, a job, children, all the peaceful extras that come with a sense of security. But not everybody felt that way. Like the drifters who rode west after a Patamux, there were thousands of veterans in 1945 who flatly rejected the idea of going back to their pre-war pattern. They didn't want order, but privacy, and time to figure things out. It was a nervous downhill feeling, a mean kind of angst that always comes out of wars. A compressed sense of time on the outer limits of fatalism. They wanted more action, and one of the ways to look for it was on a big motorcycle. In 1947, the state was alive with bikes, nearly all of them powerful American-made irons, from Harley Davidson and Indian. Two dozen gleaming stripped-down Harleys filled the parking lot of a bar called the El Adobe. The angels were shouting, laughing, and drinking beer, paying no attention to two teenage boys who stood on the fringe of the crowd looking scared. Finally, one of the boys spoke to a lean-bearded outlaw named Gut. We like your bikes, man. They're really sharp. Gut glanced at him, and then at the bikes. I'm glad you like them, he said. They're all we have. September 1965. The Hells Angels of the 60s were not keenly interested in their origins or spiritual ancestors. Those guys aren't around anymore, Berger told me. But some were. Although in 1965 it wasn't easy to locate them. Some were dead. Others were in prison. And those who'd gone straight were inclined to avoid publicity. One of the few I managed to locate was Pretum Bobo. I found him on a Saturday afternoon in the Sausalito Yacht Harbor across the bay from San Francisco, getting his 40-foot sloop in shape for a one-way cruise to the Caribbean. His crew for the ship, he said, would consist of his 16-year-old son, two seaworthy Hells Angels, and his striking blonde British girlfriend, who was stretched out on the deck in a blue bikini. Freedom was one of the two lifetime members of the Frisco Angels chapter. The other, Frank, retired from the outlaw world after seven years as Frisco president. It is now surfing in the South Pacific. Frank is the George Washington of Angeldom. His name is mentioned with reverence, among the other chapters as well as Frisco. He was the best president we ever had, they say. He held us together, man, and he was good for us. Frank had class, and he said many styles, from the gold earring to the purple dyed beard to the clip-on nose ring that he wore whenever he had the right audience. All during his reign, from 1955 to 1962, he held a steady job as a respected cameraman. But he needed more action than any job could provide. For this, he had the Angels. A vehicle for his humor and fantasies. A stop for any aggressions and an occasional chance to bust out of the workday murk like some kind of saber-rattling golem and lay at least a small jolt on people he had no other way of reaching. Frank was so completely hip that he went down to Hollywood and bought the blue and yellow striped sweatshirt that Lee Marvin wore in The Wild One. Frank wore it ragged, and not only for runs and parties. When he felt the Angels were being persecuted beyond the norm, who would make an appearance in the police chief's office, wearing his Hollywood sweatshirt and demanding justice. If that didn't get results, he would go to the American Civil Liberties Union, a step that Oakland's Barger has flatly ruled out because of its communist implications. Unlike Barger, Frank had a wry sense of humor and a very sophisticated instinct for self-preservation. In seven years at the head of what was the biggest and wildest of all the Hells Angels chapters, then and now, he was never arrested and never had an intramural fight. Even the Angels find this record amazing. Freedom had to win his vice presidency by fighting seven Angels, all in the space of one week, three in one night, and whipping them all into sore pulps. But that was Bobo's gig. Before the Hells Angels came into his life, he was one of San Francisco's more promising middleweight boxers. And it was no feat for him to put down a half a dozen unsuspecting tavern brawlers. Later, when he became a karate expert, 
He heavily destroyed a new generation of challengers. The angels considered him a valuable hatchet man. The punch-out artist is a good thing to have around, said one. But he has to cool it around his buddies. Some guys get boozed up and just start teeing off on people. Until his departure, Bobo was the horned toad of waterfront literary bars. His colleagues were not eager to drink with him, and for good reason. He was not a comfortable man to get drunk with. Once in a fit of pique, he lashed out with a karate shop and cracked a four-inch thick marble bench in the Hall of Justice. Even the police were leery of him. He ran a karate school and enjoyed death battles. A karate version of, of No Limit Bare Knuckle Boxing Matches of the John L. Sullivan era. A karate version of the No Limit Bare Knuckle Boxing Matches of the John L. Sullivan era. It is not necessary for one of the combatants to die, but the fight will continue until one of them can't stand up for whatever reason. And if the reason happens to be death, then the prearranged understanding among both fighters and carefully screened spectators is that death is accidental. Others note, deaths are extremely rare. The combat usually ends when the backers of either man decide the cause is lost. Unfortunately, Bobo accepted a spur-of-the-moment death challenge from a visiting Jap on a night when a San Francisco Society columnist and several of her friends had come to see him about the possibility of an offbeat feature. The result was a nightmare of blood, fierce screaming, and a panic in the gallery. Nobody was killed, but it was a very crude show. Then soon afterward, Freedom Bobo's name was removed from the roles of licensed karate instructors. It was only then, after exhausting all their means of demoralizing the public, that he turned seriously to writing. Several years earlier, he had given up bikes because of the stigma. After a long stint as a motorcycle messenger, he stumbled on the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam and thought it necessary to publish his own views. He could, however, only on the condition that he moved through the streets of the world in a conventional fashion. I felt like a whore, he says, but I told the editor I'd play it straight. Hell, I didn't want to spend the rest of my life as a delivery boy. Freedom Bobo was a study in something, but I was never sure what to call it. He is a walking monument to everything the Hell's Angels would like to stand for, though which few of them do. Freedom is the complete outlaw, and he somehow makes it work. Like Frank, he went through his whole activist period without ever being arrested. All it takes is a sense to be quiet around cops, he says. Whenever we had trouble with the law, I just drifted off to the side and kept my mouth shut. If a cop ever asked me a question, I'd answer politely and say, sir. In those situations, man, a cop appreciates somebody calling him sir. It's a smart thing to do, that's all. And besides, it's a hell of a lot cheaper than going to jail. Bobo was a motorcycle this long before he was a hell's angel. He remembers one night when he passed the corner of Leavenworth and Market in downtown San Francisco, and he saw a bunch of bikers outside a pool hall called Antones. He stopped by to say hello, and soon afterward he was part of a loosely knit group of riders who called themselves, half-jokingly, the Market Street Commandos. Motorcycles were comparatively rare in the early 1950s, and people who rode them were happy to find company. You could go by there any hour of the day or night, Freedom recalls, and there'd always be at least ten bikes out in front, Sometimes on weekends there'd be 50 or 60. It was a police problem even then. Businessmen were complaining the bikes kept customers from parking in front of their stores. The Marcus Street Commandos drifted on, without much action, for about a year. Then, in early 1954, the Wild One came to town, and things changed. We went up to the Fox Theater on Market Street, said Freedom. There were about 50 of us, with jugs of wine and our black leather jackets, we sat up there in the balcony and smoked cigars and drank wine and cheered like bastards. We could all see ourselves right there on the screen, man. We were all Marlon Brando. I guess I must have seen it four or five times. The commandos were still in the grip of the wild one when the second new wave hit, in the person of the wild prophet Rocky, the Messiah, bringing the word from Southland. Ten years later, Bernie Jarvis, a San Francisco Chronicle police reporter, former Hell's Angel, Describe the moment of truth in an article. One hot summer day in 1954, a swarthy handsome devil sporting a pointed beard and a derby. Broad slid his Harley Davidson to a screeching halt at a motorcycle hangout in San Francisco. His faded blue Levi jacket, the sleeves roughly hacked off with a knife, was emblazed with a leering winged death's head that has become so well known to Californian lawmen. 
You could see the sweat-stained armpits of his checkered shirt. He wrestled the four-foot-high handlebars into position. With a flick of his wrist, he blasted the afternoon quiet of a Sunday on Market Street. He laid his bike over on the kickstand, polished the glistening chrome of his XA spring forks, four inches longer than stock, with a ragged handkerchief. He looked around him, nonchalantly wiping his greasy hands on his oil-crusted jeans. This was Rocky. Nobody cared what his last name was, because he was classical, and he was a hell's angel from down Burdu way. Thirty cyclists with polished boots and neatly barbered hair had watched his arrival, not without suspicion, because he was, at that time, a stranger, and all of them had been riding pals for a long time. The welcoming committee was primed for membership in the Hell's Angels. Although completely square compared to the latter-day Angels, the street corner gang had constant brushes with the law. Rocky was elected president of the new batch of the Hell's Angels because he could really ride, and because he had style. He could spend donuts on that hog with his feet on the pegs, and man, he was a wiggy cat. A member of the Angels recalled, the cyclist found a seamstress who could duplicate Rocky's sinister emblem, and it wasn't long before nearly 40 angels were roaring out of San Francisco. The neat Hell's Angels Frisco surrounding the grinning skull with wings cost $7.50 and was ordinarily sewn on a Levi jacket. The white background of the red lettering soon became spotted with grime and blood from the many barroom battles that ensued. Listen, man, those beefs ain't our fault, said a battle-scarred veteran of beer hall punch-outs. We'd go into a bar and someone'd mouth off or try to move in on our chicks, and then we'd fight. What else could you do? Police reports kept pouring in as the angels were forced to move from one hangout to another. A hangout, usually an all-night restaurant or a pool hall, would last about a week until complaints of noisy or rowdy behavior brought the law. We chased those bike bums off Market Street because they were having drag races right through the traffic. A lot of them were stealing motorcycles and we'd check them all out, said Terrible Ted, a motorcycle policeman who once called several of the Hell's Angels as friends. We called that bike heat Terrible Ted because he really was a bad man. Why, well, he'd ride like a nut to catch us and then he'd throw the book at us. Other note. In 1966, Terrible Ted ran a red light in an unmarked police car and collided with a Greyhound bus. The crash killed his wife, destroyed the car, and critically injured the patrolman. It got so I had to go to work just so as I could pay off my tickets and stay out of the slammer, said an angel who lost his license to drive four times because of his driving record. One humorous incident connected with the Hell's Angels insignia several years ago was still a source of amusement to the hard-riding cycle gang. An angel known as the Mute was stopped for speeding by a policeman near the beach in Santa Cruz one Sunday afternoon. The Mute was proudly displaying his colors on a ragged Levi jacket. Take that off, the patrolman jotted down on a notepad politely offered by the Mute, who was deaf and dumb. The Mute stripped off his Levi jacket, exposing another angel decal on his leather jacket. Take that off too, the irate patrolman ordered, again using the mute's notepad and pencil. And under the leather jacket was a wool shirt, also emblazoned with the club colors. Off with it, the officer scribbled angrily. Under the shirt was an undershirt. It too had been stenciled with the club insignia. Okay, wise guy, take that off too, the nonplussed patrolman wrote. With a smirk, the mute removed his undershirt and puffing out his chest, brought into full view the Hell's Angel's grinning death's head, which had been tattooed on his body. The policeman threw up his hands in disgust, handed the mute a ticket, and sped off in his patrol car. But the mute had the last laugh. He was prepared to go all the way. His trousers and shorts were also stenciled. He was a way out mother, the mute's friends agree. People are already down on us because we're Hell's Angels. That's why we like to blow their minds, man. It just more or less burns them, that's all. Zorro. Many of the angels were graduates of other outlaw clubs, some of which, like the booze fighters, were as numerous and fearsome in their time as the angels are today. It was the booze fighters, not the Hell's Angels, 
who kicked off the Hollister Riot, which led to the filming of The Wild One. That was in 1947, when the average Hells Angel in the 1960s was less than 10 years old. Hollister at that time was a town of about 4,000, a farming community an hour's fast drive south of Oakland, off in the foothills of the Diablo Mountain Range. Its only claim to fame in 1947 was the producer of 74% of all the garlic consumed in the United States. Hollister was, and remains to some extent, the kind of town that Hollywood showed the world in the film version of East of Eden, a place where the commander of the local American Legion post is by definition a civic leader. So it came to pass, on July 4th of that year, that the citizens of Hollister gathered together for the annual celebration, the traditional Independence Day rites, flags, bands, baton, virgins, etc., were scheduled to proceed a more contemporary event, the annual motorcycle hill climb and speed tests, which the previous year had drawn contestants from miles around. Valley boys, farmers, small-town merchants, veterans, just a crowd of decent fellows who happened to ride motorcycles. The 1947 Hollister hill climb and races also drew contestants from miles around. Many miles and many contestants. When the sun rose out of the Diablos on the 4th of July morning, the seven-man local police force was nervously sipping coffee after a sleepless night attempting to control something like 3,000 motorcycles. The police say 4,000. Veteran cyclists say 2,000. So 3,000 is probably about right. It has been established beyond doubt, however, that Hollister filled up with so many bikes that a 1,000 or more or less didn't make much difference. The mob grew more and more unmanageable. By dusk, the whole downtown area was littered with empty broken beer bottles and the cyclists were staging drag races up and down Main Street. Drunken fistfights developed into full-scale brawls. Legend has it that the cyclists literally took over the town, defied the police, manhandled local women, looted the taverns, and stomped anyone who got in their way. The madness of that weekend got enough headlines to interest an obscure producer named Stanley Kramer and a young actor named Brando. Shortly before her death, in 1966, Hollywood gossip columnist Hedda Hopper took note of the Hells Angels' menace and traced its origins back through the years to the Wild One. This led her to blame the whole outlaw phenomenon on Kramer, Brando, and everyone else in any way connected with the movie. The truth is that The Wild One, despite an admittedly fictional treatment, was an inspired piece of film journalism. Instead of institutionalizing common knowledge in the style of time, it told a story that was only beginning to happen, and which was inevitably influenced by the film. It gave the outlaws a lasting romance-glazed image of himself, a coherent reflection that only a very few had been able to find in a mirror and it quickly became the bike rider's answer to The Sun Also Rises. The image is not valid, but its wide acceptance can hardly be blamed on the movie. The Wild One was careful to distinguish between good outlaws and bad outlaws. But the people who were most influenced chose to identify with Brando instead of Lee Marvin, whose role as the villain was a lot more true to life than Brando's portrayal of the confused hero. They saw themselves as modern Robin Hoods, virile inarticulate brutes, whose good instincts got warped somewhere in the struggle for self-expression and who spent the rest of their violent lives seeking revenge on a world that had done them wrong when they were young and defenseless. Another of Hollywood's contributions to the Hells Angels lore is the name. The Angels say they were named after a famous World War I bomber squadron that was stationed near Los Angeles, and whose personnel raced around the area on motorcycles when they weren't airborne. There are others who say the Angels got their name from a 1930 Gene Harlow movie based on some screenwriter's idea of an Army Air Corps that may or may not have existed at the time in the First World War. It was called Hells Angels, and no doubt was still being shown in 1950, when the restless veterans who founded the first angel chapter at Fontana were still trying to decide what to do with themselves. While the name might have originated before any Hell's Angel was born, it was lost in the history of some obscure Southern California military base, until Hollywood made it famous, and also created the image of wild men on motorcycles, an image that was later adopted and drastically modified by a new breed of outcasts that not even Hollywood could conceive of, until they appeared in the flesh on California highways. The concept of the motorcycle outlaw was as uniquely American as jazz. Nothing like them had ever existed. In some ways, they appear to be some kind of half-breed anachronism, a human hangover from the era of the Wild West. Yet in other ways, they were as news television. There was absolutely no precedent in the years after World War II for large gangs of hoodlums on motorcycles, reveling in violence, worshipping mobility, and thinking nothing of riding 500 miles on a weekend. To whoop it up with other gangs of cyclists in some country hamlet, entirely unprepared to handle even a dozen peaceful tourists. Many picturesque outback villages got their first taste of tourism, not from families driving Fords or Chevrolets, but from clusters of boozing city boys on motorcycles. In retrospect, eyewitness accounts of the Hollister Riot seemed timid compared to the film. A more accurate comment on the nature of the Hollister Riot is the fact that a hastily assembled force of only 29 cops had the whole show under control by noon of July 5th. By nightfall, 
the main body of cyclists had roared out of town, in the best time style, to seek new nadirs and sordid behavior. Those who stayed behind did so at the request of the police. Their punishment ranged from $25 traffic fines to 90 days in jail for indecent exposure. Of the 6,000 to 8,000 people supposedly involved in the fracas, a total of 50 were treated for injuries at the local hospital. For a better perspective on motorcycle riots, it helps to keep in mind that more than 50,000 Americans die each year as a result of automobile accidents. Nobody has ever accused the Hells Angels of wanton killing, at least not in court. But it boggles the nerves to consider what might happen if the outlaws were ever deemed legally responsible for even three or four human deaths, by accident or otherwise. Probably every motorcycle rider in California would be jerked off the streets and ground into hamburger. For a lot of reasons that are often contradictory, the sight and sound of a man on a motorcycle has an unpleasant effect on the majority of Americans who drive cars. At one point, in the wake of the Hells Angels uproar, a reporter for the New York Herald Tribune did a long article on the motorcycle scene and decided in the course of his research that there is something about the sight of a passing motorcyclist that tempts many automobile drivers to commit murder. Nearly everyone who has ridden a bike for any length of time will agree. The highways are crowded with people who drive as if their sole purpose in getting behind the wheel is to avenge every wrong ever done to them by man, beast, or fate. The only thing that keeps them in line is their own fear of death, jail, and lawsuits, which are much less likely if they can find a motorcycle to challenge, instead of another 2,000-pound car or a concrete abutment. A motorcyclist has to drive as if everybody else on the road is up to kill them. A few of them are, and many of those who aren't are just as dangerous. Because the only thing that can alter their careless and grain driving habits is the threat of punishment, either legal or physical. And there is nothing about a motorcycle to threaten any man in a car. Father's note. Freedom Bobo tells a story about a man in a big new car who forced him off the road on Highway 40 one Sunday afternoon in the 1950s. The dirty little bastard kept running up on my tail light, said Freedom, until finally I just pulled over and stopped. The other guys had seen it, so we decided to teach the bastard a lesson. Man, we swarmed all over him. We whipped on his hood with chains, tore off his aerial, and smashed every window we could reach. All this at about 70 miles an hour, man. He didn't even slow down. He was terrified. A bike is totally vulnerable. Its only defense is maneuverability. And every accident situation is potentially fatal. Especially on a freeway, where there is no room to fall without being run over almost instantly. Despite these hazards, California, where freeways are a way of life, is by long odds the nation's biggest motorcycle market.